gold trails and ghost towns. Share the adventures of our early pioneers as we explore the development of the Pacific Northwest and beyond with your host, Mike Roberts, and historian, Bill Barley. Welcome to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. I'm Mike Roberts, and with me is Bill Barley. He's our storyteller and uh, author and uh, writer and uh, researcher and mo a museum owner, too, I guess, these days. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the boundary country today. Grand Forks is where we're getting back to. Yeah, we go one of those. This is one of these for almost forgotten parts of British Columbia. Many other people in British Columbia aren't aware of the Boundary District and its rich history. Now, we've touched on it, Mike. We've touched on it before. But now we come into a place which was originally called La Grand Prairie. And that was named by the fur traders, and they frequented this area in the 1850s, the 1860s, and the 1870s. By the late 1860s, through this wide valley, and we have to get the, the picture, it's very close to the American border, verdant grass, lots of sunshine, two rivers coming through the valley. So there's grass and water, everything a cattleman needs. So when the Dudney Trail goes through, it carries a lot of miners through, but they're on their way through. They're on their way east, Mike. Going somewhere else. That's right. They're going into the West Kootenai District, or they're going into the East Kootenai District, or maybe into the Big Bend. They're not stopping in La Grand Prairie. But the, the cattlemen do come in, and they're, they're really the forerunner of the cattlemen is a guy called Jim McConnell. And Jim McConnell is working for Judge Haynes out of that South Okanagan country, and he, he, he treks, 3,000 cattle over the Dudney Trail. So he comes up over Anacus, long trip, down into Rock Creek and past McKinney Creek, down the Kettle Valley, and right up through a rather difficult trail, right up over Deadwood Mountain and down into this big valley, which they know as La Grand Prairie. So he's the first of, uh, of, of many cowboys to come into the area. And he's followed by Gilpin and Jones, two other cattlemen. And they, they, begin, they, they begin carving out their own empires here on two rivers. And the two rivers are the Kettle River and one they call them the North Fork. And the North Fork really is, is the Granby today. But it was then known as the North Fork. It was known as the North Fork for many years. And then two other individuals follow. Ernest Spraggett, who had the certainly the loudest voice in the boundary country, notorious mm. character. This is what he's remembered for, having the loudest voice? Well, yeah, there's some interesting stories about Spraggett, which we'll allude to later on. And a guy called Sidney Almond. And all of these are longtime names in, the, in this boundary country. They're the, they're the originals. They are the, they are the first pioneers. Now, the interesting thing is, is that at that time, grass was the draw, but in other parts of, of British Columbia, for instance, by the 1880s, they're starting to make discoveries in Nelson, you know, the Silver King. Mm -hmm. And by the early 1890s, a whole flood of discoveries come in through that southern interior country. And it attracts miners like a magnet from all across the Pacific Slope, from Idaho, from Montana, from Washington State, from Oregon, from California, from Eastern Canada. And they flood into places like the Silvery Slope Can. They come into Rossland, of course, the famous Golden City. They come into Nelson. They come into various other parts of the West Kootenai. They come into the East Kootenai country. And then they just start, start to discover mines in the Boundary District. So they discover Phoenix, which is fabulous. They discover very close to Phoenix, the BC and the Oradonoro. They discover Camp McKinney is another discovery, Deadwood, and it goes on and on. Now the miners start getting interested in the, in the country directly around Grand Prairie. Okay, when we come back, we'll take a look at how Grand Prairie changes to Grand Forks and talk about its history right after these words. Welcome back to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Mike Roberts, Bill Barley. We're talking about, well, at this stage of the game, La Grande Prairie. Mm -hmm. Couldn't keep that name, though. No, they couldn't keep the name, Mike, because there were there's another Grand Prairie, actually, in the north, between the North Okanagan country and Kamloops. So, so it began tentatively be known as Grand Forks, which, of course, described the junction of the two rivers. And in that area, they began going up the, prospecting very seriously up the Grand B or the North Fork, and they came across a number of propositions that looked pretty good, especially Franklin Camp. Now, Franklin Camp became ultimately really uh, really quite a magnificent area for mining, but at that time it wasn't. And they came across little, little mines like the Golden Eagle and the Hummingbird and the Pathfinder and the, and the Union, and the Union, and, of course, the Rock Candy. And, the rock uh, candy. Yeah, well, really the rock was candy really wasn't. It was just because of the. It, it provides flux for the smell. There's a lot of quartz in the rock candy, various colors of rock, and so on. And that's what it eventually is shipped thousands of tons of ore into the trail smelter eventually. Did it have anything to do with the big rock candy mountain or anything well, like that? It was. was it? 
Mike, I don't know whether it was named after that song or not. I know my dad worked at the Rock Candy Mine in the 1900s and my late father in the 1920s. And uh, there's still signs of it there, and people go up there and pick up samples. But, however, I'm, I'm getting off the track a little bit here. So some of, those, some of those properties were really considered world beaters. Now, they were never world beaters, but they were considered world beaters. And with the result that, that Grand Forks soon became kind of a division point. The railroad was coming into town, and it was, it was a transportation center. Uh, there, was a mi there was mining interests all around the area. Uh, it was really the center of the boundary country. It was vying with Greenwood at that particular time. And Greenwood was going to be, they felt, the great metropolis of the boundary country. Grand Forks was convinced they were going to be the great metropolis of the boundary country. And a lot of people, such as the Henderson family here, got uh, were, were quite sure they were. Then this, I mean, we've seen stock certificates before. They were not worth the paper they were printed on. No. But this one, worth a buck, was for the Grand Forks Gold Mining Company. Yeah. Did it ever turn out to anything? I mean, there, was there ever a Grand Forks Gold Mining Company? Well, yes, there was. But that was a paper company by the Henderson family. And uh, it just it never really got off the ground. But the interesting thing to note, Mike, is there, that is 1896. Mm -hmm. It is now known as Grand Forks. And that's very early. Now, we'll take a look at this shot, which we see coming up on the screen right now. And this is very interesting, because this is probably Grand Forks in 1896. Now, it shows the Granby coming in the, in, the, in the foreground, and the town just starting to take shape behind that. And in the background, that's Observation Mountain, which I found fascinating as a kid. I was born in Grand Forks, you see, Mike. Oh, oh yes. And, uh, and w when I looked up at Observation Mountain as a kid in the 1930s, I saw a big crown, an illuminated crown up there. And that had been put there about the turn of the century. And it was really quite fascinating to me. And I, of course, I, at that time, I thought Observation Mountain was a huge mountain. Go back and look at it today. Doesn't look too it's big just, uh, at you know, all, Mike, at all. That's the way it is with kids. The biggest house I was ever in was the one I was raised in as a kid. I went back to it. It was a dinky little place. Well, sure, yeah, sure. That's right. So Grand Forks starts to take shape. And by 1897, they're feeling so confident that they, they petitioned the provincial government to become an incorporated city. Now, their population is only 500. But they, they're granted their wish. Grand Forks becomes an incorporated city. By 1898, one year later, the population is doubled. They are really, really moving in the boundary country. They are now have, they can, they can boast 1,000 population. But up springs a rival, and the rival is about one and a half miles west of Grand Forks. The Grand, Grand Forks people call it West Grand Forks, but the new, the new town site holders call it Columbia. They have one advantage, Mike, and the advantage is this. The railway station, the CPR puts, they put it smack dab in Columbia, but they call it Grand Forks. <laughs> in the middle of this rival town site. And here's what the Grand Forks, here's what the Grand Forks and, uh, and Columbia people are, are all disturbed about. There's a about. war of words going on here, undoubtedly. Oh, oh, most definitely. And one of the guys leading the assault against Grand Forks is a guy called Ross, A.W. Ross. So he writes the CPR. And I take this from Grand Forks, the first hundred years. This is by Allison Glim, Jim Glanville. And they're, they're old time pioneers in the area. The family is a good, good history of Grand Forks. And he says this to the, to the magnets of the CPR. Um, if you act now and promptly, we can get the best people to move from Grand Forks and the, and the scoundrels can stay. But their influence will be gone and they can do no harm. Then he goes on to say, uh, destroy the evil influence of Grand Forks <laughs> and build up a city here in Columbia. I will point out a few things that can be done which would help us. And the time is opportune. For if a movement can be made, as our people are beginning to feel better and have confidence. If we had got assistance one year ago, there would be practically no Grand Forks today. So he's really pushing the, the evil case. influence. This, uh, this, sure. this is uh, this is real verbiage. This stuff. Now, what happens to the evil influence of Grand Forks? Obviously, well, nothing. Not not really much, because Grand Forks has a population of 1,000. Columbia, which we see here, just building. They have seven seven hotels, Mike. Number of other businesses, but only a population of 300. And, and several things happened to kind of dampen the spirits of these guys. One of the vice presidents of the, of the land company is a guy called C.S. Morris. Now, C.S. Morris is on the, on the letterhead of the land company brochures and, and all the, you know, the proposals that they're sending out to people all over. Somebody has some sort of idea, and they get a picture of this guy, C.S. Morris, and they recognize he is not C.S. Morris. He is a guy called Charlie Hinckley. And Charlie Hinckley has a very checkered past. Charlie Hinckley was in was in New York City in 1885, which is just about uh, 14 years before. And he made it quite a splash in New York City, Mike. He embezzled $97,000. And <laughs> $97,000 in the Bank of New York City was not easily forgiven. No, no I can imagine. You, see, you have to multiply it by what? 40 times, Mike. 
40, so that's, that's, that's an abysmal today of, you know, about four million. He really gouged them. That's right, he did gouge them. So he wakes up one morning, there's a knock on the door, he opens the door, and there are three New York City detectives, plus a provincial policeman. They arrest Hinckley, he is taken to Rossland, and there he sits before the judge, and the judge looks at this case, and he, and he realizes that Hinckley is a, is a swindler on the grand style, <laughs> and uh, that he should be sent back, but he looks at the law, and it is an extraditable offense. So he suggests to Hinckley, Hinkley, Mr. Mr. Hinkley, said, I think you should go back to Spokane and face the music. Well, oh, sure. No <laughs> sure he did. <laughs> there's no way Hinkley is going back to Spokane to face the music. Yeah. So uh, he, he just wanders off, and Hinkley disappears from the scene. And, of course, and of course the, the, the town of Columbia is not far behind. And the reason, Mike, is, is there are several reasons. One is that Phoenix is now booming, and the, and the copper ore is pouring out of Phoenix, and gold ore as well. And they, they establish... They have to establish a smelter where there's abundant water supply. They choose the North Fork. Grand Fork. That's right. They choose the North Fork River, right, right near Grand Forks, just above Grand Forks. They changed the name of the river to the Granby, and the Granby Company was the great company of Phoenix. And they ship from the old Ironsides, and they ship from the Knob Hill. And Mike, the interesting thing is, a lot of people don't know this, is that those ore trains that ran from Grand Forks to Phoenix and from Phoenix to Grand Forks made the round trip about three times a day, and they rent 24 hours a day, seven days a week, from 1900 to 1919, practically 20 years. Gee, that was wealth, the ore was and, oh, inexhaustible. Staggering. Between 80 and 90 million dollars in ore, at the value then of gold at about 20 dollars an ounce, and, 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 and copper at uh, just a few cents a pound. So they, well, obviously you put a smelter at a place the population's sure. got to sure. be there. Well, what happened, Mike? They blow in, they blow in the, the, the first part of the smelter in uh, 1900, and then they add more and more and more as it goes on. Before long, there were 400 workers employed at the Granby Works in Grand Forks. And this smelter, as you can see from the various shots here, is one of the great smelters of the interior of British Columbia. Not only is it one of the great smelters of the interior, it is the greatest non ferrous smelter in the British Empire, and one of the great copper smelters of the world. See, they so you, you're making a distinction between a, an iron ore smelter yeah, right. and a copper smelter. Yeah. So it's the largest non-ferrous in the British Empire. The British entirely. Empire. Sure. This includes India, Australia, uh, Great Britain, of right course. Right in Grand Forks. Yeah, right in Grand Forks, right in Little Grand Forks. And, of course, what happens is, of course, over the years, over 16 million tons of ore are shipped into the, into the Granby smelter in Grand Forks. And, it, and as you can see from the various interior pictures, it's, it's quite an establishment indeed. Well, obviously, it was going to be the center of, uh, of activity in Grand Forks or in the boundary country, and it succeeded. And some of these shots of uh, the growth of the place really show you a tremendous town site. Yeah, they do. And what you find here is that, first of all, Grand Forks attracts all the amenities of a town. You know, it has, uh, it has about uh, 10 or 15 hotels. It has, uh, it has a theater. It has three banks. You know, it has the Royal Bank. It has the, uh, uh, the Eastern Townships Bank. It has the British American Trust. It has a, a number of bordellos, and the bordellos <laughs> are the Blue Goose and the Harem and the Mascot and the, and the Second Office and, uh, and the, uh, the inhabitants. Second Office. The Second I mean, Office. Yeah. What a cheeky, what a cheeky yeah. name for yeah. their bordello. Yeah, and it was it was a very busy town. I mean, the, you know, the, the 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 next shot shows shows some uh, shows some teamsters coming down the main street, and I think this shot is probably Mike about 1897, because this is probably prior to the railroad. These guys are almost definitely hauling in from Marcus. They're hauling in from the east. When the railroad comes, it pretty well puts them out of business, yeah. and uh, so that so that Grand Forks is really becoming a cosmopolitan town. And, uh, and, of course, they have a number of hotels, and I think the, the most famous, you know, you have the Yale, and you have the, the Grand Forks, and you have the Winnipeg, and you have the Province, and a half a dozen others. And, by the way, they charged each hotel owner $1,000 per annum, City Council and Grand Forks. That is steep business license. That's heavy 1897, business 1897, right? around that time? Yeah, but um, the biggest hotel... And I think probably, and the people in Nelson will debate this, but I think probably the grandest hotel in the interior is the Yale, the original Yale, sitting right down by the banks of the Grand B. Uh, Look at the turret there. I mean, that, well, sure. that, is that turret the way it was originally constructed? Yeah. What a magnificent structure. Oh, yeah. Marvelous structure. And uh, Overlooking the scene at Granby. What a well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, and, yeah, you know, it's marvelous. It has dozens and dozens, scores of rooms, actually. Yeah. And it's just one of the hotels in town.
And any hotel worth its salt, of course, has its own china. And the Yale Hotel, no different. There it is embossed right on the plate here. Yeah. That's a, 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 is this a tough thing to get hold of as a collector of yeah. artifacts? Yeah. The reason why, Mike, is this. is because the original Yale, the first Yale Hotel, burns. It burns to the ground in 1908. <laughs> devastating loss, along with much of the business district down by the Grand Bay. Almost two blocks go in that 1908 fire. It just vanishes. But you know, it doesn't stop Grand Forks. They rebuild on those blocks again. And you can see the, 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 the photographs of the fire here and see how devastating it is, especially near, you know, on that part of the street. What's that and large concrete or block building right well, in there? Mike, that's certainly a vault. Now, whether that's the vault, the, the hotel vault of the, of the Yale or one of the banks, I can't really say. And there's no indication on the photograph. And these photographs are from the Boundary Museum in Grand Forks. Nothing on the back of it to indicate whether it's from the hotel or whether it's from one of the banks. Could be either. But it remains intact, as you see. Having the smelter there obviously means, I mean, this place oh, sure. is there for a long time so they for can sure. rebuild. And they thought the smelter oil would run forever, so they rebuilt. Another fire hits in 1911. Three years later, devastates part of the town again, much of Bridge Street and part, other parts of the town, but it survives and it comes right through that intact and still building for the future. There are some great characters associated with Grand Forks, as if you didn't know, we'll address that subject when we come back after this break. Welcome back to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. As you might expect, a town like Grand Forks would attract a character or two, but some of the ones you've told me about most unlikely heroes. Uh, tell yeah. me about some of them. Well, I think, I think this, first, this first shot will tell us something. This is one of the great mansions of Grand Forks. This is the Averill Mansion, named after Dr. C.W. Averill. He was a dentist, and he went out to the various mining camps and, and really did the circuit of mining camps, carried with him a number of, of uh, gold coins, and he would melt them down and put in bridge work and all the rest of it, and built a mansion for his wife who didn't want to live in Grand Forks. And it's marvelous. And here's the mansion in, in all its glory. Stained glass window, turret, veranda, uh, right up there with a, with a wide expanse, a view of both rivers. And by the way, Mike, that, that building still stands today. It's in danger. What a treasure. Yeah, it is. It really is a treasure, and I think it should be saved because it's very worthy of saving. And the interesting thing is, is a uh, number of people looked at it, they haven't bought it. And uh, there is a story, and a very, very, uh, fairly well documented that, that the place is haunted because the Averill family fell into, oh, great misfortunes later on in their, in their career. You know, one of the children died, and, and, uh, and he, he, he fell into very serious illness. And uh, the story is that it's haunted, and there's a woman weeping in the top, of the, in the top story of the house in one of the bedrooms. And this has, been, this has been verified by a number of people. So I don't usually tell haunted, haunted house stories, but this is kind of an interesting one. And the fact that it's still there well, and sure. dates back and is sure. a, a linchpin of this uh, yeah. of this community. Yeah, uh, and it's, it's not there. the only one. Yeah. You know, mining was still extant, and they they went back into Franklin Camp, and there's an example right there, Mike. This thing, what is yeah. what's special yeah. about well, this? Well, that is really quite unique. It isn't usually your burlap bag to hold ore. This is to hold high grade ore. This and you is can see canvas. Where, yeah? That's right. Where they sewed it together, Mike. They sewed it together so nobody would be dipping into that bag to take out some high-grade ore. And this was from the famous Union Mine. And the famous Union, of course, was up the North Fork. And in the 1920s, it came back into its own with a bang. They started mining ore that was so fabulously rich, they got up to 40 ounces a ton, 41 ounces a ton. They sent one shipment of ore out of there, Hecla Mining Corporation, one of the great mining giants of the Northwest, and it averaged 41 ounces to the ton, and they sent out $43,000 worth of ore. And you know, this is, this is before the price of gold goes up. It's staggering, absolutely staggering. And here is the last of was the old company seals. And do, I get to, do I get to manipulate you can have, this? You can have that, yes. The, the, this is the last and the greatest of the company seals. And this is a mining company seal. And guess whose name is on it? Press it down this way, Mike. Okay. Far enough? That's far enough. And if you take that out, you will see, if you hold it up, that this says the Union Mining, mining Company. company and it's really quite spectacular. And that was, that was out of Grand Forks, got it some years ago, and uh, really a very nice artifact. What a thing to have. May I do that again? I just want to well, feel- Well, sure you can. Okay, I want to feel like, who is the man who would use this? This is the president of the company or yeah. his treasury, his controller? The treasurer. Yes, here's yeah. your dividend check, madam. Yeah. And it's done and in. And it's signed and sealed. What and, a, uh, what but, a kick. Now, now, this is a mining company, yeah. but there were other guys in there that were equally as fascinating. I think one of the most 
intriguing characters ever to walk down Bridge Street in Grand Forks was a guy called Bill Purich. But he was never called Bill. He was called Haywire Bill, Barbed Wire Bill, Rattlesnake Bill. And his idea of a nice, comfortable afternoon was to go hunting rattlesnakes and kill as many as he could. Sometimes with dynamite, sometimes with a gun. <laughs> and uh, he was an amazing character. I remember him very well, Mike, as a kid, and later as a young man. And he was about five feet, four inches tall, but he was wide, very heavily built man, extremely powerful. In fact, my father told me a story about it once they were, they were in Grand Forks and a circus came to town. And one of the big draws for the circus where they'd have a big wrestler in there who was very well known, and they would offer any, any local guy $50. And that was, that, was, that was a lot of money in the Depression. That was the early 1930s. $50 if they could pin their wrestler. Never been done. They'd gone all through the interior of British Columbia in some very tough towns, towns like Salmo and, and Trail and, and Rossland. And their fair share of rough customers. You bet they did. Nobody pinned this wrestler. And so the guy said, Purich, there's $50 in this. So he gets up, sheds his jacket, walks out in the ring, and this guy grabs him. Purich grabs him and slams him over the shoulder onto the mat, pins him in about five seconds. <laughs> and the, oh, the owners were just just staggered. Then they tried to worm out of it, and the guys went to the edge of the tent and started rocking the tent back and forth, and they were going to pull the whole tent down. They said, okay, okay, we'll pay the $50. Peerage is $50 richer. Rattlesnake Bill oh, Peerage. Yeah. yeah. Are there other names? I'm, so, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, my mind fails me. What were some of his other names? Well, Rattlesnake Bill Peerage, uh, Barbed Wire Bill Peerage, barbed and wire. sometimes Haywire Bill Peerage. Right. You know, he had a number of different names. I, I got him in my mind now. Sure, and he wasn't the only guy. There were lots of guys there. There were guys like Volcanic Brown and Volcanic Volcanic Brown had seven nicknames, six or seven. Volcanic <laughs> Brown, uh, uh, Gold Tooth Brown, North Point Brown, uh, Bedbug Brown, Crazy Brown. Those are just some of them. And he had a mine up that North Fork, Mike, he thought was a world beater, and he called it Volcanic Mountain. And he drove in there hundreds of feet, all by himself, single jacking all the way. And he said, that mine is going to be so rich, Mike, that all the lead pencils and Grand Forks can't add it up, and I'm going to have no, no banks, didn't like banks at all, no churches, didn't like churches, no schools, but he'd have four railroads coming in there, one from the north, one from the south, one from the east, and one from the west. Nothing ever came of it, of course, although he was really quite a spectacular character. He was just spouting off. Sure he was. Okay. And one other, I think one other thing we should mention <laughs> is that there is kind of a, a lost treasure story in that area, and the Mamel family can tell you about it, but so could my late father. Up in Morrissey Creek, a number of different times over the last 40 or 50 years, there's been some high-grade silver float found, and Morrissey Creek is a creek. Float is ore. Chunks of That's rock. Very, very high grade silver. And it isn't it isn't Galena. It's high grade silver and it just is actually spectacular. Everyone's triangulated. They've gone back and forth in the Morrissey Creek area, and they have not been able to find it. And I think that's in the middle of a, of a mineral belt. Close by, I think there's some little ledge up there in the Morrissey Creek area that somebody's gonna stumble across someday. All you have to do is get there. All you have to do is find that float that that's was right. found how long ago? 1920s? 1920s and then yeah. 1930s, 1940s. Just great. Grand Forks started off as La Grande Prairie, had its fights, had its fires, but the Granby smelter was the thing that had kept it cooking and uh, the subject of our story tonight on Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Thanks for being along. We'll bring up more stories of uh, British Columbia's amazing past next time. Join us then for Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Bye-bye.